Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, if I spent the next week trying to find adequate words to tell you how much I am enjoying and appreciating being with my old British American friends, I couldn't do it. I am beyond, beyond delight tonight. My welcome is to each and everyone here. Thank you very much for coming. I also extend warm welcome and thanks to our guests from overseas. We have a number of them tonight, and I'd just like to mention their names. Peter and Jackie Phillips. Peter. <laughs> Peter kicked off the writing of this book. And we're delighted to have you tonight, Peter. David and Grace Thurlow. <laughs> David is a co-author of the book along with Peter and me. And David is going to speak to you when I'm through. Roger and Bab Sayers. R Roger recounts an interesting story in the book and played a very rich and important role in the life of British American. He too is going to be asked to speak. David Watson. David, where are you? <coughs> David deserves honorable mention for his expertise in setting, in editing, and pulling the book together. It wouldn't exist without his skill, his patience, and his computer knowledge. John Wybrew is with us. John was president of Windsor Life Insurance Company, one of BA's European subsidiaries. He flew in just for the occasion, and I'm going to ask him to say a few words about his experience with British American. Every guest is important. Every person in this room is very special. And I have a little, more than a little concern at selecting just a few to mention. We have a number of Bahamians, not here tonight, but I'm going to mention their names anyway. Anthony Roll, affectionately known as Boozy. He was invited tonight. I don't think he's here. He was president of British American of the Bahamas Limited. Michael Turner was vice president and secretary of BA Bahamas. And Roosevelt Finlayson, Roosevelt is here. <laughs> and give him a little applause. <clears throat> there may be others of you. And if I've overlooked anyone, please forgive me. Our book wouldn't be complete without special mention of Margaret and Jim French. <laughs> Jim kept what I believe to be the only surviving, I've heard there's another one that Roger has, but I have believed at the time that I heard it to be the only surviving collection of British Americans in-house magazine, the Tropical Light which was later named The Navigator. From his books, we were able to refresh memories and lift most of the photographs. Jim and Margaret were the most moved couple in the company's history, having moved internationally five times. Can you believe that? I'm not sure if he would approve my telling of this, but I believe Jim to be the oldest person in the room. <laughs> and I have a special 
word of thanks for Mr. Anwar Sandergi and his wife, who are not here, and for Mike Anderson, who was also is not here. They are both principals of the Fidelity Group of Companies. Fidelity made a tremendously generous and much appreciated donation to help defray the cost of this party. Anwar has also been president of British American and Mike was an accountant in First Homo in Cape Man. He is the man that you see in the newspapers who talks in nothing but millions. <coughs> We also had a very warm and a very generous mes message from Peyton Woodson, our former chairman of British American. He offered to help with the cost of this party. It's always nice to have too much of a good thing. And we got offers from both the Fidelity Group and Peyton Woodson. So we're all paid up tonight. <laughs> and I've saved the best wine for the last. Sir Jeffrey and Lady Johnstone are with us, and he deserves very, very special mention. I'll only tell you about British American connections of his. He's a man of so many attributes that I won't try to even go there with him. His father, Bruce Johnstone, was the Nassau manager of British American long before any of us were associated with the company. Further, Sir Jeffrey was a British American debit agent before he went off to law school in England. I can imagine his mother saying, Jeffrey, being a British American agent is too complicated for you. Go to England and do something simple like studying law. <clears throat> he is the longest associated man in the room with British American. And I'll go. I'm going to go a step further. He is the longest associated person in the world with British American. <laughs> if you would all give Sir Jeffrey and all the others who I named a nice round of applause, I appreciate it. <clears throat> Almost 62 years ago, on the 26th of May, 1952, my life took two major turns. On that day, Helen and I got married. On the same day, Don Hart, the boss of British American in Jamaica, put me on the company's payroll. I was 22 years old, and if memory serves me right, the pay was 24 pounds a week. Doesn't sound like much today, but it wasn't a bad pay for my age and at that time. I must be the only person in the world who started a job on a two-week honeymoon. <laughs> two weeks later, I came back to planet Earth and presented myself at a very different British American office to the one that you joined. In 1952, British American had offices in Nassau and Jamaica, and lousy reputations in both places. It was known in derogatory terms as that sixpence a week company. British American had 18 agents in Kingston, and through no particular design, Nassau had the same number. There were another 10 or 12 managerial and clerical employees in both. To top it off, Peninsula's office in Jacksonville housed three executives, 
along with secretaries and a few clerical employees, all in all for a total of somewhat over 50 warm bodies for the whole company. That was in 1952. The life of a company, perhaps not every company, but certainly the life of British American, lends itself to comparison with the life of a man or woman in today's world. BA was incorporated and drew its first baby breath in Nassau in 1920. Its first 30 years until 1950 were spent going through the pangs of infancy, adolescence, and finally adulthood. And that adulthood led to readiness to face the challenges of the world. Lawrence Lee Jr. came into the scene in 1950. His father, Lawrence Lee Sr., was the chairman of the board, and Larry Jr. was the logical choice for being elected president. In those days, British American was a wholly owned subsidiary of Peninsula Life Insurance Company. And you'll get an idea of the value that Peninsula placed on their investment in BA when I tell you that British American was carried on their books for the princely sum of one dollar. Larry's imagination, his vision, his determination to create a world-girding company of exceptional quality built British American into the company that most of you joined. Under his leadership, BA prospered and expanded, probably more so than any other company born in the Bahamas. I have to mention Bob Morris and his successor, Roger Sayers, who is here with us tonight. They managed the organization and sales offices of this company and carried it into islands and countries all around the world. And I like to tell myself a little bit that I played a small part in the whole thing. As British American moved beyond its 40th year, there was a time when it seemed poised to conquer the entire business world, but problems were developing. A lot of local investments turned sour, New exchange controls hampered the movement of money and insurance regulators came up with new demands. Early in the 70s, leadership changed from Larry Lee Jr. to his cousin, Peyton Woodson. And that was followed not long afterwards by major changes in top management. Expansion of the weekly premium business, up to then the company's mainstay, slowed down, and the ordinary life sold by the European subsidiaries came to the fore. Family problems manifested themselves. A long and difficult story culminated in the original owners, the beneficiaries of the Macmillan Trust, selling their interest. That was the beginning of the end of British American. After a lifetime of 70 plus years, the company was broken up, sold, and struck off the rolls. In the same way that we humans make inevitable returns to the arms of our makers. A useful rule for speakers is to never leave your audience on a down note. So stay with me a little as I change gears and lighten it up. Like the human use, they, like the human used in this comparison, British American also had DNA, and I don't mean the local political party. I mean the equivalent of people's DNA. BA had a special brand of it. I had it, you had it, we all had it. We not only got it from BA, but we generated our own brand and pumped it back into BA. It works much like love. 
you never have too much of it, you never deplete your supply, and the more you give, the more you receive in return. Mother British American passed it along to her subsidiaries, they passed it along to their employees and associates. We all have it, including my two daughters who are here with me tonight, and I'm happy to have them. We hold a common heritage, and I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to share these thoughts with you tonight. So I take you back to the book. We have copies of the book for sale this evening, and I'm sure you'll find it to be enjoyable reading and worthwhile reading. It'll be like unleashing the memories stored in an old family album. I'm now going to ask David Thurlow if he will come and take the mics, both of them, and talk to us for a little about his experiences. Let me add my warm welcome to everyone tonight. When we talked about this, we thought about it as a, an old school reunion of, of types, and we don't want to make this too heavy. Um, Carol's covered the waterfront pretty well, and I'm not going to take too much time at the podium. But the first thing I wanted to do was, for any of you who have an ambition to write a book, I would like to deter you. <laughs> and, and I thought that I might let you into a few of the secrets of how this book came to be. Um, I joined, I, I went to Jamaica in 1962 with Price Waterhouse. One of my clients was British American Insurance Company. And uh, it's just about 50 years since I met my two co-authors. Carol Davidson was then a big vice president of the company, Larry Lee's confident, and he hired me, or he hired me through Ed Cowan anyway. Peter had been there a long time. And together, we worked as management for a while in Jamaica. And then I got transferred to Nassau. And there I joined up with Roger Sayers and other members of the team. And we operated as a troika for a while and managed the company as a threesome. So it was, a, it was an interesting period of time in my life. And I learned an awful lot. And I want to thank these gentlemen for helping me along the way. Now, when it comes to the book, I've been talking with uh, Peter and Jackie Phillips are staying with us these few days. I've been trying to understand from Peter exactly when we started to write this book. First of all, he was telling me it was, oh, just five or six years ago. I believe it was something like 10, 12, or 15 years ago. We talked about the possibility of a book many times, but no one took any actions to do it. But Peter is the most meticulous note taker I have ever come across in my business life. And with, with us this weekend, he's still got a little notebook, and he's still recording. He's trying to create a book of his own life that goes into the most minute detail. So I've been testing him of the things that he should have in it. And I said, Peter, do you remember in Jamaica when I just joined the company that we climbed the Blue Mountain, and we got the Blue Mountain Peak, and there was you, and there was me, and there was Pip Lancaster, and he sums it through here, and he says, I'm not sure I've got this. I'm not sure I've got this. But anyway, that's Peter. He takes notes. And so it was Peter who's been taking notes for a long time that started this. And it started with wanting to write his, uh, some language on his own career. It started at Barclays Bank and moved to uh, British American. And uh, we went from there. Peter then found out that Jim French, as Carol was saying a little while ago, had all these corporate magazine means we used to have. It was changed its name, but I call it the Navigator. And so Peter had a trove of information which came from the Navigator. And at this point, the book was mainly about people, about experiences in far off lands, and about those people that rose through the ranks of British American. Then, of course, we had to start with a history. And Mr. D is the historian of British American par excellence, and he goes back to the earliest days. He was there long before the rest of us. And so he put some bones around the early days of how the trust was created and the, the, the founding family, our famous trust. And so now we had, we were 
starting in the 20s and coming all the way forward to the 60s. Then, of course, uh, it struck Peter that somewhere along the line that, gee, we really need someone who knows how to print books, how to edit books. And so David Watson was dragged into this fray, I think enthusiastically at the beginning. I'm not sure how he thinks tonight. <laughs> he did tell me that he would never print another B book in his life, but <laughs> that was, uh, that's after many hundreds of hours of his time. This book would not be printed today without David Watson, and I admire his <laughs> skills at doing that. Now, I, I wasn't in this process at all, but at this point, Peter made the mistake of saying, David, have a read of this. I was back in the Bahamas by now, and we used to meet once in a while, and so I read this book. And I said, well, yeah, it's pretty good as far as it goes, but you know, British American is a great story, and it needs more. It needs some financial underlay and overlay over to, to support on what you're talking about with all the sales organization. This is about the sales organization. So, uh, okay, I said, and I have, a, and I think I'm the only one who had, a complete set of our British American annual reports over about a 20-year period. And they were very close to me because every year it was my responsibility to produce these things. So now we had a whole new avenue of material and pictures of boards of directors and officer meetings and all the rest of it. So we then started writing some more about that. And now we were getting to a book which was quite interesting. And then I said, well, you know, we've got to have some themes that run through this book. The, the people and the photographs are great, but there's some really important themes which I think some people the business-minded amongst us might enjoy. So now we, we talked about the role of the Macmillan Trust, you know, which was formed in 1920 and was with us all our lives. And they were very much three different families and none of them got on with, and none of them thought the same way as the other. And they got into the Wilmington, Delaware courts about once every 10 years and had a fisticuffs. In other words, litigation. So the control at the trust level changed several times, which made it very difficult for we as management to try and maneuver through that. And then I said, the other, the other thing which is interesting through here is that <clears throat> we were mainly in, in the, uh, the British colonies of life, life mainly English speaking. And of course, in this era that we're talking about, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the British Empire unraveled all of these emerging companies which we operated in now were independent. They wanted their own insurance law. They wanted to control their own currency. And they wanted to control foreign currencies. And they wanted to control work permits. And they wanted to control everything, naturally. And all of this had a dramatic effect on British Americans' finances because we were operating as one company from the middle. Now we had to put, set up operations with different management teams in every country in which we operated. And we operated in 30-something countries, so it was a big task. So all of, all of that is woven into this book now. And then some of the historical places that we did business in, Jamaica was our main country in the Caribbean that we built. And over this period of time, Jamaica went to pot. And there, when I went to Jamaica in 1960, a pot is probably, a, a <laughs> probably another term. But when I went there in 1962, the Jamaican dollar was worth more than the US dollar. It was worth about a dollar ten. By the time we exited Jamaica back 20, what, 25 years later or something, the, the Jamaican dollar was worth, Peter, how much? A few cents. Yeah. And so what, what that did to us, it completely wiped out one of our largest operations in life. Not only did it wipe out our operations, it devalued every Jamaican policy owner's savings in their insurance policies. And it was an absolute disaster. And the same thing happened to us in Nigeria. The Nigerian Naira at one time was worth more than the US dollar. Then they had all these oil revenues and all these problems and the currency was worth nothing. So one of the, another one of the major countries we developed was gone. So all of these things are now woven into this book and I hope that it will provide 
interesting reading, both if you're only looking at the pictures and the events or reading the stories or have a business interest in it or how, it, how we um, operated in the Bahamas because we were a very prominent company in the Bahamas in those days and we were, had investments in all kinds of non-insurance uh, entities as most of you know including the Montague Hotel and the Pilot House and a lot of other non-insurance activities. So we had a lot of challenges. But anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about. I'm hoping everyone is going to buy a book or two because we need to cover our printing costs. And uh, I wish you happy reading. Please also note, and David is probably going to tell you this, but you can, you, anyone will be able to get this book online. And uh, you'll be able to go online, put the history of British American in your browser, and up will pop a screen which will tell you how you can buy it online and get it shipped to you with some shipping costs, I'm sure. So that's how we plan to distribute the book. And David Watson is hoping to continue with this uh, um, website that we're going to develop to enable people in other parts of the world. What we probably don't know here is that in all, all kinds of parts of the British American world, there are little groups of ex-British American people who still communicate with each other, who still send messages around the world, and in the Far East, in Africa, in Central America, in the Caribbean. It's amazing how many of these little groups have kept together and support each other. So that's about what I had to say. I'd last like to pass the baton to my colleague of Roger Sayers. I haven't seen him in, I think, 20 years, and I'm delighted to see him and Babs this evening. I understand that Babs is now a professional golfer, so I want to talk to her, but I'll hand it over to Roger. Thank you, everyone. I was asked to speak for 10 minutes. Well, I want to assure you that I'm not going to speak for 10 minutes. I'm well, going to relax and sit back for the next hour. <laughs> I've got an awful lot to say. I really do. But, uh, I will try to keep it, I know that I'm on the tail end of the speakers, so I will try to keep it as, as short as I can. But I wanted to uh, congratulate those guys who put this book together. Peter and David and Carol uh, have, have developed a masterpiece. It really is a masterpiece. And of course, David Watson, uh, the labor of love for him to keep putting these pieces all together. I, I just wrote my own book on my own mind, so I know what it's involved in. He worked his backside off to get it from that. I urge you to read it because it's full of sex appeal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, British American as a company had loads and loads of sex appeal. It really did. <laughs> the charisma coming out of our ears when we just were the charismatic company. And I urge you to read the book. Really. And I know it's a lot of charisma in the company because I was a part of it. <laughs> I started as an agent in Bermuda, uh, 1956. Um, I never saw anything before. Uh, this little company had come into town uh, peddling weekly premium policy. And uh, people didn't think was going to last, but some friends of mine were making lots of money working for this new company. Well, I had just gotten married, and of course, I needed lots of money too. <laughs> a good wife here. <laughs> so I joined the, I joined the company, and uh, even though the majority of communion said this company won't last, it won't last, it can't last, what they didn't know was that. The average communion working class had never been able to establish an estate for himself with the payment of a small weekly premium and then have somebody come every week to collect it before he had a chance to spend it. <laughs> they didn't know this. So the business took off like a bomb. I started at 18 pounds a week, which I thought was not bad. At the end of the first year, I was bringing home 100 pounds a week which is more than the government was made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the business really 
took off. You know? And it became, of course, it became the catalyst for you, it became the catalyst for the development of the company all over the world. I mean, the tremendous explosion of expansion that we had. A lot of Bermuda, 41 families out of Bermuda went around the world, all parts of the world, worked for this company. And they didn't even bat an eye when they were asked to move. They would move in the drop of a hat, almost anywhere. It's going to show you the faith that they had in the company, the charisma that they had. It's phenomenal, it's pretty hard. I can speak from a personal point of view. When I was living in Jamaica, I'd only been there 15 months, I was transferred to there. Bob Marks, who was my boss, came to the office. And he said, Roger, I want you to go to Trinidad. You've got a problem on it. My only question was, when? He said, how about next week? I said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, Bob. I said, my wife is pregnant. She's home in England visiting her family. And you want me to go to Trinidad next week? He said, call her. And I had to meet a phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I called her. Hello, honey. How are you? <laughs> she said, I'm fine. I said, well, thank goodness, because when you come home, I won't be there. I'll be in Trinidad. But we've been moved to Trinidad. And I had a good, beautiful, British-American wife. She said, okay. <laughs> that was it. I thought that, that I would just mention that few things about Larry Lee, who was the charisma, the charisma I was talking about behind the compass. A very charismatic guy who was just in the morning. He had some wonderful sayings. I number one of them, if I can remember it. <laughs> if I can remember it. <laughs> Character is that quality that one has that forces him to follow through with a commitment long after the mood in which that commitment was made has passed. Think about it. Think about it. And here's an example. Here's an example. Bob Morris, sorry, Harry visited Walter when Jim and Martha French were. Took them out to dinner and said to Jim, how do you like it here? Jim said, good, very nice. It's all right, but I, I miss my fish and grits. Lots of fish here, of course, but no grits. <laughs> well, I don't know whether Larry Lee said to, said to Jim, I'll send you some. But two weeks later, a package arrived with Jim Frank with five pounds of grits <laughs> from Larry Lee. <laughs> that was the kind of guy he was, and that's some of the needs. Some of the feelings that he put into the, into the building of the company. You know? I thought a great deal of him. The other thing that I remember to say, his father said, father said, if you look after your employees, they will look after your company. I don't think that would work so well today, but it sure as hell worked then. Because we sent these folks all over the world to build this company with very little guarantees at all. The strange places they probably never even heard of. And they stayed there and built the company because they had faith in us. And I think it all stems from people like Larry. Uh, tremendous development, the way it was. His father said, Look after your people and look after your company. And they all look after it. And so on. They did. They really did. Well, first American expanded at a phenomenal rate. You went to 30 countries in no time at all, but then it began to slow down a bit. Well, one of the reasons it slowed down is that we were running out of countries. <laughs> <laughs> the other reason was that the governments were one of your piece of the action. And they were coming into to the business, taking portions of the business and national action. So that the expansion wasn't so fast anymore. So we had to develop an operation to look after British Americans, wholly owned. Branches. And we call it branch operation. Very logical when you think of it. And we started the branch operation and I was allowed to look after it. Well, it was a market sector. 
and had to have its own financial control, its own administration, its own agency. So I began to form the department heads. Joe uh, O'Gill took over the, the agency for me. He was developed Edmonton, sitting right here, took off to the uh, administration. We had no one to look after the finance. Well, we had to advertise and pay for this. So I did. And the first applicant was a lady, which kind of shook me off. I didn't even think of a lady. But after she convinced me that she could do the job that I was offering, and then told me she was half Jewish and half Greek, I hired her immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and she did a remarkable job. Thank you, George. <laughs> Oh, I do yeah. And the first place you sent me was the cave. <laughs> <laughs> they needed help. <laughs> and I came back and you closed down the operation. <laughs> After my report. I made a very good decision. <laughs> Joining British America was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I found that I could be get there for a good I've had a great life with this company. I love this company. I really did. Um, and for the first 25 years of my 30 years with the company, it was just phenomenal. But I traveled over the world, the first class. I stayed in the first class hotel. I reported to the board of directors. I was well paid. You know, a young man who never finished high school and was in the right place at the right time. I felt really very lucky. And thank you to British America for offering me that opportunity. So, so in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, the book, it's in the book. Please buy it and read it. It's really worth the money. It's an excellent book. And it will tell you a bit about what I've been talking about is the, the mutual respect and admiration that we had for each other, the company and the employee. And with that, I will now introduce John Weiber. Thank you very much. That was um, most entertaining. And uh, it, it takes, I stand here now 30 years on, awaiting my ninth grandchild. And I look at you guys, you haven't changed a bit, which is fantastic. But then when I look more deeply at all of us, I see that we've moved from being bright young men and women to um, respected elder statesmen and elder stateswomen. And not a bad transition. And coming here today reminded me very much of my first British American annual conference. Bear in mind that my business life had been in England, my traveling, business traveling had been in Europe and the United States. So I'd never really been to the Caribbean. I'd never been to a conference like British Americans. And every year, I liked it more and more, and I looked forward to it more and more. But the first one, I was sharing a room with a, a guy called James Ball, who's sadly deceased. Um, and he came from Europe as well. He was an Englishman running a business in Luxembourg. And for, so for the first day of the conference, we dressed to go to work. And in our case, it was wearing suit, tie, the whole kit. Um, when we arrived at the conference, everyone else is wearing casual clothes. And everyone was very nice about it. They did, to use an old English expression, take the piss out of us a little bit, but in a very nice way. And we figured in, in Peter's ode at the end of the conference for our, our style of dress. But I remember after the first day, James said to me, what do you think we should do? I said, well, what can we do? <laughs> the best we can do is take our tie off, and that's not really going to do the trick. I think we just have to carry on and say, well, this is the way we think things ought to be done. But um, it, was, it was a very happy time, and I learned a lot from, um, from those conferences, not just so much from the presentations, perhaps more from the people, mixing with a wonderful group of people, different cultures, religions, parts of the world, um, it gave me a love for the Caribbean, which has prevailed, and, and I now bought a house and have lived in a house, I live in a house in the Caribbean for quite a large part of my life. Um, I love the climate, I like the way of life, and I owe all that to, uh, to British American. 
And I remember also in my early days coming to Nassau as a very much an outsider, the, the absolute kindness and warmth that was shown to me by the people who worked here and the, and the management here. And it, and it was real, it was genuine. And um, I remember some very happy times. I just run through a few things with the authors of the book, for example, with, with Peter and Jackie, where, where they invited us to dinner one night and Peter showed us the tropical plants in the garden, the tropical fruit, which I'd never seen growing actually anywhere. You just see it on supermarket shelves. And a uh, wonderful evening. Um, the parties with, uh, with David and Grace at his beach house, which, uh, which were always enormous fun. Um, plenty of swimming, plenty of sunshine, plenty of beer, plenty of good things. Um, I remember going out with Babs and Roger on, uh, on their boat with James Ball again. Roger and James sat in the boat drinking beer. Babs and I were trying to prise a lobster out of a pipe um, while they just uh, derided us, rightly so, because uh, although much as I love scuba diving, I've never actually caught a lobster yet. I've had one in my hands, but actually getting it in your hands and keeping it in your hands is a rather different thing. Um, great times. And, um, and with uh, David Watson, I remember going to his house for... Uh, at lunch and uh, play with the pool and he had over the the entrance to his pool a sign which said welcome to our ool double ol notice it has no p in it we like to keep it that way <laughs> whatever happened to that sign david you still got it <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and with Carol, uh, travelling with Carol on one of the outer islands, but I can't even remember what we were doing, but we were waiting for a taxi. And uh, it was really late, and you know, standing, it was hot, and I was getting frustrated by it. And um, Carol said, no, you've got to calm down, John. It's, 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 uh, you know, in Nassau, we have something called island time. But now you're out on the islands, things move a whole lot slower. And of course, he was absolutely right, you know, and since then, I must admit, I, I've never tried to, I've never concerned myself too much with things I can't do anything about, and that certainly fell into that category, um, as do most other things in life when you think about it. So I became a much more relaxed person as a result. So um, thank you, British American, for all of those things. Because I managed to get to free up some time from, um, from Windsor Life, David gave me a bit of a roving assignment and so I got to spend some time with some of the other great characters in the Caribbean um, like Tony Jones and Albert Tom Yu and, and Carl Gray. Um, I mean, wonderful times. So I hope I was of some use to them. Um, I was then dispatched to look at the Spanish operation which was run by an, an emotional train crash called Alberto Moth de la Torres. Um, that was a challenge, but um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, uh, in a masochistic sort of way, I got quite fond of him, but um, not, not that fond. Um, <laughs> and having come back to the board and, um, and, and said, well, my recommendation was you've got to get out of here, um, because if you don't, with Spain joining the, what was then the EU, the, uh, now is the EEC, all insurance companies are being required to hike their capital by huge amounts of money. And you're never going to get it back. You know, there's no way to go here. It's the wrong place, the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. So um, they said, okay. So David came back and said, that was a really good report. Thanks very much. Will you go and do it? <laughs> Which was not what I had in mind at all. And of course, uh, then I had to confront Alberto again, who... Um, regarded me as something of a traitor to his cause, having made the recommendation to kick him out of a job, basically. But uh, we got through it, partly by bribing him and a few other things, but it was another one of... Uh, my... Anyway, I must have done quite a good job, because then I was given the plum position of Director of British American Nigeria, and... Um... <laughs> the least said about that, the better, probably. But it's made good dinner party conversation and um, a host of stories, but... Not an experience I'd want to uh, repeat, I don't think. But looking back at the, uh, at the time here, I think, firstly, thank you all of the authors for, for doing this. As Roger said, it's a labor of love. Of course it is. Um, and as Peyton said in his note to Carol, it's an extraordinary company that can inspire people so long after the event to put that time and effort into writing about it. 
and, and setting down on paper their memories of something. How often does that happen? Um, hardly ever. Particularly many years after the company is no more. So thank you all very much for that. David, up there, thank you so much for um, getting me to come here. Thank you uh, so much for everything. If David spent half the time on you lot that he spent on me, I don't think he's slept for the last six months. Yeah. He's not only been my, my, my travel agent, he's been my, my, my computer advisor. He's taught me how to watch BBC television in St. Bart's and a zillion other things. <laughs> so he's, he's, yeah. um, and um, I don't know what you're going to do with yourself now, David. It, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> Relaxing is probably not, 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 not in the books, I don't think. <laughs> but can I just say, regarding British American, uh, I've been very fortunate in my time since I left British America, and I've had a, a really good career. I've had some great jobs. I've done some things which I, I can look back on with, with some pride. More importantly, I've had more than my share of good fortune and luck, which is vital ingredient in, in, in life. Um, but when I look back, actually nothing really compares with those few years I had with British American in the 70s and 80s um, in terms of the fellowship and the camaraderie and the, the, just the fun and the team spirit of a, of a, a business which was uh, striving to do great things. So I'd like to thank all of you for part in that and thank you very much for inviting me here. And if we're going to have a toast, I'd like to have one to absent friends. Thank you, John, very, very much. And that concludes our formal part of the evening. We're now going to have some books up here. And if anyone would like to uh, buy a British American book, they cost $25 a piece. And uh, if you will come forward. We will start the sale of the books. Thank you all very, very much for coming and for being with us on this auspicious occasion. Thank you.